I think the thing that struck me the most the first time I saw neurosurgery was how the hell do they know what they're doing? Like how, <laughs> how many billion cells did we just yeah. lop off there? And obviously this speaks to what you're talking about from a functional standpoint. But, um, but a lot of times you're not doing that, right? So if a patient has a meningioma or, or some other tumor, um, how, how do you bracket that trade-off. So do you, do you sort of just sort of say, look, there are places where you never want to have a tumor. For example, right above my left ear, that would be a really difficult place to have to resect because the real estate is so precious and that's where we're going to probably recommend doing an open awake procedure to help guide us. Is that kind of how you're using that? That's exactly right. And so um, the real estate <clears throat> is critical. That's an understatement. Um, but that being said, there is some really expensive real estate in there, and there's also some cheaper real estate. But, but that's, I guess that's my point, Eddie. It's like, <laughs> that's sort of like telling me about Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. there's no cheap real estate in Manhattan. <laughs> right. There happen right. to be areas that are right. $10,000 a square foot, right. but there's probably nothing less than okay. 4000 a square foot. So, so there is this like popular idea that we only need 10% of our brain. I'm sure you've heard this I, before. I've heard this and I don't okay. know what it means. It okay. sounds like malarkey to me. Right, so. That might mean to stay alive. Okay, right. To, 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 to respire, you might right. only need 10% right. of your brain. So what, what it really means is that there is maybe about 10 or 15% that um, is very critical for our basic functions, our ability to move, to talk, you know, to see, et cetera. It's actually a lot more than that. But um, it's also referring to this point that there are parts of our brain, actually, that are extremely redundant with other parts of the brain. So the frontal lobes, for example. Um, we do surgeries there routinely, and oftentimes people really have no effect. Even in terms of judgment, even in terms of... Absolutely, yeah. Because so, okay. we always think of the frontal lobe as where we have sort of executive function and where we have the ability. We always joke, like one right. of my friends in med school, we said he had no right. frontal lobe. Exactly. He just couldn't yeah. stop saying the most inappropriate right. things. And don't get me wrong, uh, the frontal lobe actually has a lot of critical function for executive decision making, you know, impulse control, et cetera. But um, my point is that it's redundant, meaning that um, different parts of the frontal lobe actually have similar purposes and similar role. And so um, for the most part, a lot of our patients can accommodate a fairly large surgery, sometimes even removing the entire frontal lobe. Both with, sides? No, not both no. sides. Okay. Really, uh, usually these pathologies are only yep. on one side. And so, so if you took the entire frontal lobe from the left or right side, would there, would there be a, sub a substantial difference? Uh, I've done that many times, just so you know. And... Um, it really depends on the case and scenario. If someone's been having something that's slower growing there and there's been time for the brain to reorganize, what we call plasticity, mm. a lot of those functions will essentially no longer be in that right frontal lobe and they've moved to the left side. Wow. And people can tolerate What is the mechanism by which that, that happens? Well, um, time and function, meaning like these things don't happen overnight. They take, you know, sometimes weeks and years. But basically what happens is some neurons get lost over time and then others will compensate in, in, in terms of that function. But how does that actually happen? So let's posit that we have a slow growing lesion in the left frontal lobe. What is the left frontal lobe doing to communicate with the right frontal lobe yeah. to say, hey, these neurons are being compromised, their function is deteriorating, you guys need to pick up the slack. How is that yeah. message being transmitted? Well. Part of it is that both parts of the frontal lobe for people, most people, are, are both doing the function most of the time. So it's not like it's just transferring mm -hmm. the information. It's that both sides were originally you know, involved in those functions. And then one side gets weaker and the other one has to pick up that slack. Um, at a mm -hmm. cellular level, this is what we call synaptic plasticity, uh, the weights that you know essentially make up who we are. These are just the weights that neurons use to communicate with one another. All of our learning is towards shaping that weighting of synapses that occur where neurons touch each other. And um, that, that, can, that can happen, that can change you know, throughout our life. Every time we learn a new word, those are new synapses that have formed that were never there, new connections. Um, 
precisely from the left to the right side, there is this structure that we call the corpus callosum. It's an information highway that connects the left part of our brain from the right side. Um, there was a Nobel Prize, Roger Sperry, who'd done a really incredible early experiments describing patients who had surgeries where you split that, and in certain instances, you have this phenomena where people essentially like have two functioning brains, but they're not communicating to each other. Um, so it does require that there is this connection between the two areas where they're being reorganized. Now, outside of epilepsy, why else would the corpus be severed? That's really the main one that okay. we use it for. Can you describe how patients that uh, undergo that procedure behave? It's very fascinating. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.